Hey, thanks for joining me. Uh, my name is Phil Meyer, and I'm presenting uh, with Grid Markets and also some Houdini action to show you some super detailed ink simulations. So the images here are different simulations I've done, um, rendered in Houdini, all rendered with uh, Mantra, and I rendered those on the cloud service Grid Markets. So just a background on myself, I am an FX artist, and I'm currently working at the mill in Los Angeles, and I do everything from explosions to destruction to, I don't know, it's an effect, probably done it before, uh, lots of different stuff in commercials. And definitely Houdini is my tool of choice, it's very flexible, good workflow, and you can do a large range of different effects in it. And besides doing uh, just normal uh, commercial work, I also enjoy kind of working on things outside of work. Uh, the image you can see here, the um, kind of like fluid tank, that was a good, fun project. The only downside though is it took about uh, over a week to render. So I've really been enjoying using some uh, grid markets for cloud rendering because you can really uh, speed up your workflows. And um, that. So I'm going to get right into the um, actual ink simulations and renders. Uh, here's a still from one of the more um, high quality ones. Um, lots of Houdini users out here. I don't know your guys' uh, experience level, but um, a render like this has got um, hundreds of millions of points and can take on a home computer probably anywhere from four to eight days. So here's a number of different um, kind of ex experiments I've done with the actual ink simulations. So most of these are using a very similar type of um, actually fluid setup and I'll show some demos on that in a little bit. But the uh, main difference is kind of the curves used to drive the forces. Um, other than that, it's really a very similar setup. So a great example of how Houdini is very flexible and that you can have the same kind of base setup and really end up with all these different kinds of looks. And actually be getting into a little bit later in the presentation, I'll show you how I do all the different colors for it. Most of the colors come out the same on it, and then you can really uh, dial in your look at the end. And this last one here shows you kind of my color workflow from a blank render to uh, color out of the box, and then also the comp color you can achieve in the end. First main thing you want to get to when um, you start doing an ink simulation like that in Houdini is you're going to end up having to um, set up your emitter. So in this case, I've been driving all the ink simulations by a curve that I draw. And on this curve, it really defines kind of where the ink comes from and where it can go. And on the right, you kind of see the um, points that are trailed on that emitter. Um, once you have your kind of emission source set up, you can do your um, overall volume smoke simulation to get your motion set up. And you can see here the picture of the smoke that was the last render you saw. And there's kind of the dot network on the right you can see getting into that. So once you establish your motion, you'll move into getting your details. And to achieve detail, you're going to be affecting millions and millions and millions of particles. I think the highest I went on the simulation is about three to 500 million. Um, and about that, you have roughly two to 500 gigabytes of data each, each simulation. So cloud rendering is definitely advantageous in this because I did most of these on the laptop that were submitted from it, and I can't even open up the files that the cloud's able to do. So it's really helpful for high quality work. So once you set up your sim and you have a good look for it, you can go ahead, and this is my ROP tree in Houdini, and it does all the dependencies for me, so I can kick it off, go to sleep, go to the beach, do whatever, come back, and I'll have images. And this is the uh, window when you're submitting it. And it's really cool because I'm able to generate all these like gigabytes and gigabytes in the cloud, and all I have to do is submit a little seven megabyte file. So once you get it all submitted, this is the um, render window um, from Grid Markets. So you can see it's in progress, and most of them were completed. And yeah, frame time's pretty good. It's about 20 minutes for most of those frames, so really quick. And once you get those images back from the cloud, I'll show you a little COPS workflow to kind of dial in your color on your actual sim. So most of the render was done in white, so you get your uh, lights and shadows. Uh, this is the raw color that you get out of the render, and then I was able to kind of pick different color schemes in COPS after the fact and kind of preserve my lighting that way. 
So we go ahead and jump right into Houdini. So like I mentioned before, this is the um, paths that I've been emitting the simulations off of. I have just kind of a um, simple little uh, spiral tool. And this is a nice way to kind of figure out different looks, build a different spiral, you change the frequency of that. So all the different ink sims were mostly done by setting up this whole setup and then just kind of changing the curve that I was emitting from. So once you have the curve that you like, um, this is the actual object that's moving along the trail that's emitting from. And when I zoom in on it, it's super, super tiny. I don't know if you can even see that up there, but there are these little tiny points on it. And part of this emission scheme is how I was getting that really high frequency, almost kind of stringy detail. Uh, you start off with these really small lines, and then over time they kind of get pushed around. So you can use the, um, the position and keyframes at object level to translate your emitter on there. You can see how I just keyframed it over time. Just fly through and it moves along the curve. It's Again, it's really small, so you're not really missing too much. So after you have set up the emission along the curve, you can merge that into here, into another object. And I'll usually do that so I can trail it and calculate its velocity. So now you can actually see the object here. If I look at it, it's got velocity on it. I want that to help drive the simulation. And mostly after that, I'm kind of setting up this curve. So I have a basically a trail along the curve over time. Then I'm turning that into a, a rough polygon, converting that into a NURBS curve so it's nice and smooth. And then what I'm doing is a uh, resample on it so that way, no matter how fast the actual emitter moves along the curve, you get a consistent high quality point result. Um, and that really makes it really nice for fast moving objects. You don't need to worry about um, catching detail on it because it just resamples as much as you need it to. So now I'm ready to go into the um, actual DOM simulation. So I'm building a source here. And you can see I have the volume I'm going to emit from. It moves along that curve, so that's all working. So I have my source for density. You can also check out the um, velocities that I'm going to emit from. So that's all working. I'm just making sure all my attributes come out from points and get into volumes. And then this is the other thing um, that I'm going to use in my simulation. I'm scattering uh, just two points every frame, and I'm going to emit these points in the simulation as verticals. Um, and I'll get to that in a second, but just setting up the emissions for it. So moving right along into the dot portion of it. So our source is all set up. And I'll turn my resolution down a little bit to try to show you some stuff interactively. Um, this is what I was um, simulating at production level. I'm not going too high on the volume simulation. You want something kind of reasonably quick to kind of get a good idea of your motion. But again, you're getting all your details from points. Um, so you don't need to worry about having a super high quality volume. Again, it's kind of good to be able to preview this quickly. So I can play back. It's, it takes a little bit. I'm on a laptop, but it's definitely good enough to get an idea of kind of how this um, ink simulation is going to turn out and look. So the emitter is moving along the curve, and you notice that it's falling down. Usually, if you use a um, pyro sim, which I actually based my setup off of was using the pyro sim, it rises. Um, so I'm usually going to the actual simulation tab of the pyro and setting my buoyancy direction in negative y, so it sinks, kind of like ink in water. And I've also found that um, mixing in a little bit of viscosity with your um, smoke can also help to kind of hold it together and act more like um, like a thick kind of like paint-like ink in water. And in terms of other simulation options, I'm not really doing too much. A little bit of confinement to add kind of uh, vortex motion to it, and also a little disturbance. Um, not on velocity, though. I'm doing disturbance on temperature. And usually when you do disturbance, it'll kind of push and pull things up and down. I've actually gone into the pyro solver and changed the disturbance so that it only makes it sink, nothing rises up. So I don't know how many of you kind of work with micro solvers and dots. It's, it's a little tricky, but Houdini is so nice in that it's very open. So as soon as you go in there, you can kind of tweak as you see fit. So this is the whole um, uh, network in and box, how you're driving that. So you can actually just turn off this negate and you won't get any negative values, so it'll only sink. So this is kind of a, a little trick to kind of direct uh, the disturbance on that and just kind of really direct what kind of um, simulation you're going to get. 
So most of that's pretty standard pyro, except for I'm adding in uh, vorticals, which I mentioned earlier. So I have a couple points where I'm sourcing from, and then I'm emitting these vorticals into the um, simulation. And when I add those in, they kind of help stir things around quite a bit. So here's the um, geometry for vorticals. They're being affected by velocity. And then one other thing I'm doing is I'm using a, a SOP solver in DOPS. And I'm merging in these points that I set up in SOPS and just copying on their parameters for magnitude. And the only other thing I'm doing that's kind of different is that over time I'm changing their um, uh, radius and force over life. So I noticed that if you leave them all really strong the whole time, they kind of tear your sim apart too much or you kind of end up with weird kind of looking things. It's kind of nice to kind of ramp it over time and again, just really get in there and arc direct it. So that's the overview for kind of the, um, the volume workflow. I'm gonna put this one setting back. I turned it a little bit too high. So give this a quick little play. And this is doing, again, what I wanted to. And the, the cool thing about this is that once you have a good look um, of the volume locally, you can pretty confidently submit this off to the cloud to grid markets and you can get the um, very similar look with particles um, and the volume since you're infecting it. So let me show you the next step. Once you have a good dot sim, I'm gonna go ahead and import that back into my scene and objects. So I'm fetching all my uh, fields from dots, uh, just density, velocity, and temperature. Those are the ones I'm using. And right here I have a uh, grid markets cache node um, so it's very easy to kind of add that to your scene. I was actually working with a file cache that I have at home. I know studios have their own file caches. So I have some uh, switches here so I can very easily switch between working at home or working with grid markets. It's um, effortless. I just flip a switch and I can go from my home computer to the cloud. It's very simple. And there's a few options on the cloud cache. For the most part, you can just leave it alone and you can do a um, spawn in rocks. So when you click this button, it'll create an output node for you. And here's a duplicate one. I already have one, so I need that. But I have the, the first step is the volume, which I was showing you. And after you do the volume, you can cache out your points. And this is the switch I was mentioning between the local and, and the cloud cache. So just by flipping this, there's a few referenced switches in the scene. So either I can render at home or I can render in the cloud. Again, it's it's very easy to go from just a batch render locally or then go to uh, actual render submit uh, for grid markets. So, got volume, points. Now here's an output node for points. I need to show you how the point detection works. Here's the volume again that we were looking at. And I'm gonna put a trail on it so you can see kind of funky shapes coming off it, but uh, you can see there's a lot of vortex motion in there that I'm getting on that, and that kind of helps me get all the nice um, like swirls and vortices in the actual ink. So already visualizing that, we're gonna get a pretty cool result. Um, so that's the volume. I'm just using that in, in my pop sim. So again here, I'm importing that guide, guide curve that I made. And to get the color of it, I'm putting a box around it, and I'm calculating um, color based on bounds. So if I, if I plug the curve into here, you can kind of see the, the color on it. Make a dark background, you can see that a little bit easier. So when I emit the um, actual ink color from this curve, it's gonna pick up this color, this kind of rainbow color I have, and I'll be able to drive that. Uh, it'll flow through the simulation, and I'll be able to drive that in compositing later on. So pretty much doing what I was doing to make the source for the smoke earlier is that I'm just kind of trailing that, connecting a few points up, zoom in here. Again, it's, it's really small because it's really detailed. I wanted that kind of high frequency detail in the ink. Connecting these up to make a curve, converting it to nerves so I have a nice smooth curve. And then again, what I'm doing is I'm resampling this curve. And this, is, uh, this resample right here is kind of the detail quality level that I get in the end ink simulation. It determines how many points I'm going to emit at each frame. And right now, the length of the points, the distance betwi between each other is 2e negative 5. So it's like 0. 0.000002. It's very small. 
So if I turn on the point view, it pretty much looks like a continuous line. You have to keep zooming in and zooming in to kind of see any kind of point separation. So if you're doing really detailed kind of ink simulations, it helps a lot of having just millions and millions of points. As well as you have a quick moving object, you don't get any steps with it, you have a nice kind of continuous flow. So here we go into the pop simulation. And very simple, just sourcing points. And I'm doing a pop effect by volumes. So we can get a couple frames going here so we can see our uh, results. Okay, so we can see we have a uh, little swirl coming down from that. And I found that um, the best way to use the um, pop effect is set to um, update position. When you update a force, you're kind of changing your velocity and it's hard to kind of really match that exactly to your um, volume source. So if you update position, it's just directly pushing the points around by your volume, by your velocity field. So again, it's a very good way to get a one-to-one -one result. Uh, if your volume moves like this and looks like this, you will get that with your points. Um, the only other option I've changed on the pop effect is the advection method. I found a single step is, it'll get the job done, but if you use the, some of the different uh, advection methods, you can get even more detail. And I think my personal favorite that I found, just look-wise, getting nice uh, high-frequency detail and kind of keeping that stringy swirls in the ink is using the trace RK4 method. It is a little bit more expensive, but you get what you pay for. So if you want lots of detail, it can kind of help you out. Um, other than that, it's really just standard pops of just pushing them around and getting that look. So once you come out from pops, the other thing that can happen is when you're doing an effect by volume and you are um, updating the position of the points, you don't actually get a velocity from pops. So I'm just using an attribute for volume to directly copy on my volume my volume's velocity right onto my points. Um, so that way, again, just whatever the volume does, the points will do. Um, so it's, it's very easy to develop locally on your volume and then submit to the cloud and get back the expected result with um, the points. So after that, I'm really just setting it out right here and going into my final preparation for um, point rendering. So I have a render object here for my points. And all I'm doing is object merging in from that point preparation I did. And I'm clearing off any extra attributes I don't need. Because again, when you have 500 million points, any extra attributes, like um, you're not using like um, color. I'm using color in life. But if it has um, any extra attributes, it's going to be really expensive in terms of disk space to have. So might as well just clear them off. And again, too, I was before I kept setting the um, point color in the actual points and in render. But again, I like this new kind of workflow of keeping my renders as pure white and then modifying the color later on. So it just ended up to be a lot more flexible, a lot less re-rendering. So again, I have another um, grid markets cache node. So the, the um, cloud will save out all these files um, on the cloud and then render with them. They don't need to come to my workstation at all. Uh, in fact, I, I copied one from the cloud after I was finished and it was so big that I couldn't even open up my laptop. That I, my laptop just crashed. I think it took about 50 gigabytes of RAM to simulate that. My laptop only has 16, so you can imagine it just it just wouldn't work. It's much more powerful than uh, my laptop, so it was really nice. And one other uh, quick tip is that when you read in your files for rendering and it's really um, heavy points, I really like the um, load as pack disk primitive option. It'll uh, keep your scene nice and light and it won't copy your geo. When you go to translate and render, it'll just read it off disk. So that's, that's a good tip to kind of speed up your rendering workflow. So the final step, now that I have the uh, volume and point cache all set up, is to actually submit that to the cloud. And I also have my render. So go from volume, points, again, switch local or cloud. I have it on the cloud set up. Here's my render, and then I can go submit. So what this is doing now is it's looking through my entire scene and calculating every dependency that I'll need to run on the cloud. So I have all the same, um, if I have textures, models, all that stuff. And since everything is uh, procedurally generated in Houdini for this ink scene, it's, it's very light to submit. Um, I have, there's like some extra caches and stuff on here that I, that I wouldn't be submitting normally. 
Um, so if you're looking at the, uh, the pre-flight window for the cache, you have this kind of upload and download ca uh, category. So basically what you're uploading, what you're downloading. So uploading my scene file, I don't need, these are renders that I got back. So if I were to submit this right now, it's only six megabytes that I upload. It's gonna go in the cloud, simulate the volume, that'll be about 100 gigabytes. It's gonna go simulate the points after with that volume. That's gonna be probably about five, 600 gigabytes. Then it'll go to render. Gonna render in about 30 machines. Uh, turn all that data into EXR images with all my channels and colors in it. And I think when I download it's probably about like three or four gigabytes back. So I skip a huge portion of all the data required locally to make that look. So I hit save and continue. In this case I'm gonna hit cancel because I already have the images. And um, I don't know, do many of you use COPS? I haven't used COPS a ton, but I found it a really nice tool for kind of getting a quick idea of how many renders are working and it's native to Houdini, so you can even chain up a uh, comp render in your ROMs and go straight from simulation to render to composite. And you can even make a movie with it now, which I've seen is really cool. So you can, in theory, not even have to do any work locally with it. All right, so let's load in some of these renders that I have. I'm gonna turn off doc simulations. All right, perfect. So here's the uh, final result, which you viewed in the video earlier. Uh, this is the actual render that I get, the raw render. So it doesn't look too interesting, does not look like the result hardly at all. I have uh, the color right now is just the diffuse lighting. It's got the alpha, pretty standard. I have a PZ, which is depth. So you can kind of see with the hit high, you can get the inspector and see what depth and space that is. And finally, I have my own custom color that I baked in. So this is the color that I acquired from the bounding box. So basically, wherever it's emitted, it'll pick up the color in that quadrant. So if it's emitted in a different part of the box, it'll have a different color. And then that data just sticks with the particles, and they kind of move around over life as they move around in that um, ink simulation. So the first step I'm doing is just kind of adding a little bit of contrast to the um, uh, diffuse lighting itself. And on this side of the stream of uh, COPS, I'm copying over the actual color channel I have. And I'm using the hue saturation node. It's pretty cool. You can swing around the colors however you feel like. Uh, I'm also doing a color correct after to kind of get these nice um, like reds. But again, it's, it's very flexible. You can kind of push this, push this around however you want. And the best solution I found is to actually multiply the chosen color um, against your original render. So that way you preserve all your lighting highlights, but then you can really direct your color. And then there's also a cool depth of field you can do. So on the actual depth of field node, this makes a mask to use with a defocus tool. And once I do that, I can, the, uh, the depth of field is nice. It kind of helps it feel more like macro, ink and water kind of look. Uh, and you can set it really shallow. It's, uh, again, it's not using um, deep compositing. You can only go so far with the um, depth to where it starts to um, be kind of like edge artifacts. So it's it's good to use sparingly to kind of develop your look, but don't go don't go too far with it. And then this is the uh, background that I'm uh, putting it over. So just a solid color, and I have a uh, radio ramp. I'm using this to drive uh, brightness. So darkening at the edges, a little vignette. And then also this is just a um, vertical ramp. And again, kind of darkening out to, to kind of fake a little bit of lighting. So you can see that you really start with a uh, very raw render and you can really tweak the look of it. Um, for example, if I decided that I didn't like this color scheme, I was gonna go a little bit different. Kind of swing this hue around and go in here. And then maybe instead of a, a red, I go for like a blue look on the fluids. green and then change the background color too. Let's go for more of a deep red and purple. So you can see how, how quickly I can really change the look of that without doing any other uh, re-rendering just by saving out those um, channels in the EXR images. So here's kind of a comparison of different um, color schemes and different um, emission schemes from that as well too. So 
this is again that final uh, ink render that we saw that was kind of developing in COPS. And here's the final result. And again, these are the different stages of compositing. Go from raw render, colors just from a, a positional attribute in the scene, and then kind of really getting in there and then art directing the colors. So definitely what I've learned from working at home is that you do have um, very uh, imposing limitations, especially if you only have a single computer. Again, if you're doing simulations, you're generating terabytes and terabytes of data. Uh, becoming more of an engineer and IT support instead of focusing on doing artwork, and that can become uh, pretty tedious fast. You're just trying to work on a cool project. Also, too, if you did end up having a ton of machines at your house or something, if you have all these licenses and all these machines and you're not using it, it can be very expensive to have not use. So again, I've really enjoyed having a grid markets type workflow where you can just set up your scene in Houdini, work natively, send it to the cloud, um, and pretty quickly you'll get a result back and just really don't have to worry about all the technical stuff. It just It's handled for you. And again, too, um, this is the ROP setup that I've been using. Using dependencies with uh, grid markets is really helpful in that you can do all your steps automatically, keep all your really heavy data out in the cloud, not at home, and then just get your images back. And again, I was able to work from my laptop and my tethered cell phone to do all that rendering. I didn't need workstations or anything else, so it can be really um, flexible where you're at and how you do it. It's, it's a very nice workflow. Anyone have any questions about workflow, Houdini, Green Markets, anything? Yeah, so I was actually doing, um, I was doing simulations. Um, so in my ROP tree here, I have, there's like a, a cloud cache node. You can download an OTL from their website, and it has the tools for it. And when you send it to the cloud, this is actually a like smoke simulation. And then dependent after, it's a, a pop simulation for particles. And it's pushing the particles around by the actual um, smoke sim you did first. Um, so then it, there's also an option to check for that it's a simulation, so it knows to run on one machine, does the other one on one machine after, and then it'll distribute your renders out to a bunch of render nodes. So it's, it's been really good for uh, simulations. A lot faster than my laptop as well, too, which is great. Any other questions? All right, great, thank you.